This is the 12th video in a series devoted to abstract algebra. We just got finished talking about cosets, normal subgroups, as well as quotient groups. And now we want to take a step back a little bit and look at a new example of a group. Well, in fact, it's a subgroup of a group that we've been working with for a while. That being said, we will show that this new example of a group will satisfy some properties that are very important. And in fact, they'll form a nice family of examples of certain types of groups. Okay, so anyway, let's get into it. So we've got the following definitions which will form uh, the kind of ideas which we'll cover today. And before I read off these definitions, I'd like to point out that not all of them are definitely well-defined properties. So some of the things that we'll do along the way is to prove that these are indeed well-defined properties. Okay, so let's start with the first bit, and that says that two cycles are called transpositions. So here we're talking about elements of Sn. And remember, every element of Sn can be written as the product of disjoint cycles, and the length of those cycles describes what cycles they are. So you might have two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, m cycles. So if it's a two cycle, it's called a transposition, and that's because it transposes two things. Okay, our next part of our definition is about evenness and oddness of permutations. So an element sigma of Sn is called even or odd if it can be written as the product of an even or odd number of, of transpositions. So it's even if it can be written as the product of an even number and odd if it's the product of an odd number. So a priori, this may not be a well-defined property, but we will prove that it is a well-defined property. Then finally, the alternating group, which is called AN, is the subgroup of SN made up of all even permutations. So written in set builder notation, it looks like this. So AN is equal to all sigma and SN, where sigma is an even permutation. So in other words, sigma can be written as the product of an even number of transpositions. And, well, this is not even well-defined yet, but once this notion of parity is well-defined, we also will need to check that this, in fact, forms a group. Okay, so let's get to it with our first proposition, and that really tells us the usefulness of these transpositions in the first place. We'll prove that the transpositions generate the group Sn. That is, every element of Sn can be written as the product of transpositions. So let's maybe notice that we can first take a sigma and Sn and write sigma as a product of disjoint cycles. So we've done that in the past with a particular examples and we sketched a proof of why we can do that in general previously. But really what that means is that all we have to do is take an m cycle, so a cycle of length m, and write it as a product of transpositions, and then we're good to go. And we would apply that result to each of the disjoint cycles that's making up sigma. Then we've got this big long list of transpositions. Okay, and I think that can be written or that can be observed with the following equation. So let's take an M cycle. Let's say it's A1, A2, A3, up to AM. And remember what this means. This means A1 is sent to A2, A2 is sent to A3, A3 is sent to A4, all the way up to AM, which is sent back to A1. So this is a big loop. But let's notice that this can be written as the product of the following transpositions. We have A1, AM, A1, AM minus one, all the way up A1, A2. So notice these are most definitely not disjoint transpositions, but that sort of makes sense. Okay, well, let's notice a couple of things here which we can use to decide if something is even or odd immediately. So let's notice that this is a cycle of length m. That's what we started with. 
but then this over here is the product of m minus one transpositions. So let's write that down. So product of m minus one transpositions. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that a cycle is even if and only if m is odd. And that's because if m minus one is even, then m is odd. So let's maybe look at a couple of quick examples of this just so that we get like some sort of intuition for what's going on here. Let's maybe take a three cycle. We'll take the three cycle one, two, three. And by this trick up here, we can write that as one, three, one, two. And you can just quickly check that this does the right thing. So notice if we send one through here, it becomes two, then it stays the same. If we send two through here, it becomes one, it gets sent to three. And then three will get sent back to one. But this is the product of two two cycles, which means it is even. So let's notice that a three cycle is an even element of S3. Whereas if we take like one, four, five, two, that four cycle, we'll see that that's an odd element of, well, S5 in this case. And that's because we can write this as one, four, one, five, one, two. And this is definitely an odd number of transpositions. So remember when you're talking about even and odd elements of Sn, you're not talking about the length of the cycle, you're talking about the number of permutations that are required to write this cycle down. And it just turns out that those have opposite parities. So if you've got a cycle of odd length, it is an even permutation, whereas if you have a cycle of even length, that is an odd permutation. Okay, great. So now let's move on to this second dot right here, proving that this second dot is a well-defined property. So now we're gonna prove a really important proposition, which brings us towards this parity description of an element in Sn being well-defined. And in particular, we will prove that if we have a product of n transpositions, that will, that's what we have here, which is equal to the identity, then that number n is even. That means that the identity is an even element of Sn. It's an even permutation. But that means that the identity is inside of An. Which is good because over here we said that a n was a group, so it should contain the identity. But that's what we're getting out of this calculation, which will ensue here. Okay, so we're going to do this by induction on the number of cycles that we have. Okay, so let's maybe look at the n equals 1 case as well as the n equals 2 case. That'll serve as maybe our base cases. So notice if we have n equals one, then we have a single cycle a, b, but that single cycle a, b is most definitely not equal to the identity. So notice this says that if you've got things equal to the identity, then you have to have an even number of two cycles, an even number of transpositions. And that means that we needed to check this. If we had a single transposition, we don't get the identity. And I guess maybe we should quickly talk about why this is not the identity. That's because this transposition AB takes A and sends it to B. So if we're thinking about that, but that means it doesn't fix A, but that means it's not the identity. Okay, so now let's look at the N equals two case. And for the N equals two case, we have A, B, C, D equals the identity, which tells us that the transposition A, B must be equal to the transposition C, D, because transpositions are their own inverses. And we'll actually be using strong induction here, so we need a strong induction hypothesis. So let's suppose, so let's suppose all K between one and M, but not including M, um, we have if the product of k two cycles, or in other words, k transpositions equals the identity, then k is even. Okay, nice. And now before we start our induction step, let's make an observation that will help us along the calculation. 
Okay, so now let's observe the following calculation, like I said. So this is related to all possible combinations of two two cycles. So you could be combining a two cycle with itself. You would have AB, AB, and that's equal to the identity. You could combine a two cycle BC with a two cycle AB, and note that that's the same thing as the product of the two cycles AC with BC. So notice I didn't quite commute these. When I moved the two cycle that contains A to the left, it changed a little bit. That's because we have non-commutativity here when you, have do, when you do not have disjoint cycles. Okay, and then if you have C, D, A, B, those two two cycles, well, those are disjoint, so I can actually just move them. That'll give me A, B, C, D. And then finally, if you take the product of the two cycles AC and AB, that's the same thing as the product of the cycles AB with BC. And you might look at this and see, well, why are we doing this? This does not seem interesting at all. But what we're doing here is taking the appearance of A and moving it to the left. So notice A appears in the right transposition in each of these cases, but it does not appear in the right transposition in any of these cases on the right. So this is gonna be instrumental in our calculation that will finish this thing off. Now we're ready to start putting those parts together. So let's suppose that we've got M2 cycles, we'll call them A1, B1, a2, B2, all the way up to A, M, B, M, and they're equal to the identity. But now let's introduce some notation. Let's maybe set A, M just equal to A, and then use those previous calculations that we made. So I'll maybe just put star for those previous calculations to move the rightmost appearance of A to the left until one of the following two things happens. So the first thing that can happen is that the two cycle containing A is next to its inverse. So that's, like I said, most definitely something that can happen. And let's notice in this case, we have the following setup. So we'll have A1, B1, all the way up to A, B, M. Let's recall that we replaced A, M with B. Okay, so we've gotta be careful about where we find the terms involving A. So it's gonna involve a little bit of weird indexing, but I think it's okay. So here we have A1, B1, all the way up to A, I minus one, B, I minus one. And then we'll have A, B next to its inverse, like we said was going to happen. And then we'll pick up after that. So we'll have A, I plus two, and I'm gonna put a prime here, and let's talk about why it's a prime. That's because as we moved this A, M, B, M to the left, you know, we changed the appearance of those transpositions based on those commutation relations. So that means we need to rename them a little bit. And then this is gonna extend all the way up to A, M prime, B, M prime. Recall that those probably had to change as well. But now let's note that these two are inverse pairs, so they turn into the identity. And now let's count up how many permutations there are or how many transpositions there are. So this is a product of m minus two transpositions. And why is that? Because you've got one up to m, but we subtracted these two off in the middle, a product of m minus two transpositions. But then by the induction hypothesis, we have m minus two is even, which implies that m is even. Great, and that finishes it off in this possibility. But this is only one of the possibilities that the two cycle containing A is next to its inverse. So let's look at our second possibility, which is the two cycle containing A never finds its 
inverse, okay? But in that case, we have reduced A1, B1, all the way up to A, M, B, M to something of the form A, B, and then we'll have A2 prime, B2 prime, all the way up to A, M prime, B, M prime. And since it never found its inverse, that means that the leftmost appearance of A can be moved all the way to the left which means there are no A's, just no A's by themselves among this list right here. But since there's no A's right there, that means that that combination of transposition fixes A. But if that one fixes A and this one sends A to B, then that means that the whole thing does not fix a. It in fact sends A to B, but if it doesn't fix A, then that means it's not equal to the identity because the identity fixes everything. Oh, but that's a contradiction up here to our assumption that this thing was the identity in the first place. So that means that this possibility isn't really possible at all, which means the first one is the only possibility, but that led us to M being even. So that means if you express the identity as a product of transpositions, it can only be expressed as an even number of transpositions. Okay, let's go on. Now we're ready to prove that the parity of a permutation is well-defined. And that sort of finishes like this discussion right here where we define the parity in the first place. Okay, so how might we do this? Let's take some sigma in Sn and write it as the product of transpositions in two ways. So let's write sigma as tau one, tau two, all the way up to tau r, and then we'll also write it as mu one, mu two, all the way up to mu s. And I guess I should point out here that the tau i and the mu j are both transpositions. So there we've got a product of R transpositions and a product of S transpositions. And now what we'd like to show is that R and S have the same parity. That is R and S are either both even or both odd. But let's recall that in terms of congruence mod two, that's the same thing as saying that R is congruent to S mod two. So that's in fact where we will end up. Okay, well, let's maybe note that since we're working with transpositions here, we have the inverse of each of these transpositions is itself. Those are two cycles, two cycles squared of the identity, meaning that they are their own inverse. Now let's take this equation and move all of the tau's to one side. And we can do that by left multiplying by tau one and then tau two and then tau three and so on and so forth. And that'll give us the following equation. So we have the identity is equal to tau r, tau r minus one, all the way down tau two, tau one, and then mu one, mu two, all the way up to mu s. But now let's notice that this is a product of r plus s transposition. But now we've written the identity as the product of r plus s transpositions. Using that previous result, that means that r plus s is even, but that's the same thing as saying r plus s is congruent to zero mod two, but that means that r is congruent to negative s mod two, but negative s is the same thing as s mod two. So we have R is congruent to S mod two. That means that R and S are either both even or both odd. So all of that finally tells us that the notion of evenness and oddness of a permutation is well-defined. And now let's move on to showing that the alternating group is in fact a subgroup of Sn. Okay, now we'll show not only that An is a subgroup of Sn, but it's a subgroup of order n factorial over two. Let's recall that Sn is a group of order n factorial. So this is exactly half the size of the group. Let's start off by noticing that An is non-empty. And that's because it contains the identity. 
Maybe it contains the identity looking at it a couple of different ways. The identity can be written as the product of zero transpositions, the empty product, or if n is um, bigger than one, we could write it as the product of a transposition with itself. Okay, so anyway, it's non-empty. And now we'll use the subgroup test to finish it off. So let's suppose that sigma and mu are both in AN, and notice that that means that sigma can be written as tau one up to tau r, where r is even. And then mu can be written as, maybe I'll say tau one prime up to tau s prime, where s is even. So we know that r and s have to be even because we are inside of an. Now we're gonna make use of the subgroup test. Remember, that means that we need to look at sigma mu inverse and get that inside of an, and that'll finish off proving that this is a subgroup. But notice, using the standard rules for taking inverses along with the fact that transpositions are their own inverse, this is gonna turn into tau one up to tau r, and then tau s prime, tau s minus one prime, down to tau one prime. But how many transpos transpositions do we have right here? So this is r plus s total transpositions, but r plus s is even because r and s are even, so that means that this is in a n. So those two things together prove that we in fact do have a subgroup. And now what's left to do is to show that it has order in factorial over two. Okay, so let's get to that. And we're gonna do that by defining a new object. So let's say Bn is equal to all sigma in Sn such that sigma is odd. And now let's define a function and, well, two functions, but they're sort of defined the same way. So let's define a function from a n to b n, and likewise the same function from b n to a n, where f takes sigma and it sends it to some transposition. I'll take the transposition one, two on sigma. And I'd like to maybe importantly point out that this can be looked at in both directions. And that's because if you take an even permutation sigma and combine it with a single permutation, then it is an odd permutation. And likewise, if you take an odd permutation and combine it with a single transposition, it will be an even permutation. Okay, and now let's note the following. We have f evaluated at f of sigma is equal to one, two, one, two, sigma, which is equal to sigma. Oh, but that means that f evaluated at f, or f composed with f, is equal to the identity function. And it's either the identity function on a or n, or the identity function on b n, depending on how you're looking at it. But what that tells us is that f is a bijection. So recall that something is a bijection if and only if it's invertible. But if something composes to the identity, that means it is its own inverse. So in particular, it's invertible. So that's good, it's invertible, that means it's a bijection. But that finally means that the size of a n is equal to the size of b n. But, we also know that Sn is equal to the disjoint union of An and Bn. That's because Sn contains all permutations, even ones and odd ones. And there are no permutations that are neither even nor odd or both even and odd. So that's why we've got this disjoint union. But that means that the size of An plus the size of Bn is the size of Sn. But that means that twice the size of a n is equal to the size of s n, which is n factorial, but that finishes this thing off. So now we're gonna go through several lemmas that will build us towards a very important property of a n.
Now we're ready to move towards our very important result regarding the normal subgroups of a n. But before we do that, I'd like to do a quick corollary to our previous result. And that is the index of a n in s n is two, but that index being two implies that a n is a normal subgroup of s n, but that tells us that we should maybe look at the quotient group, which is a group of order two. That means that the quotient group of Sn mod An is isomorphic to Z2. And we can think about it as a set, as the set containing the coset An, and then the coset attached to the transposition one, two. And I guess like maybe looking at it like this in the end requires us to take n bigger than or equal to three. In case, in fact, in the cases when n is equal to two and one, a n is quite boring. Okay, now let's look at our lemma leading towards that next result that says for all n bigger than or equal to three, a n is generated by three cycles. Here we need n to be bigger than or equal to three because that's the only way you can have a three cycle. You can't have a three cycle in A2, for instance. Okay, so let's see how this might go. So let's take some element sigma of a n, and what we'd like to do is write sigma as the product of three cycles. So let's start by writing it as the product of an even number of two cycles. So let's write sigma as tau one and then tau one prime, and then tau two and then tau two prime, all the way up to tau m and then tau m prime. So since we're writing it as the product of an even number of transpositions, I'm gonna pair them off like this. So these are two m transpositions. And now let's notice that tau i and tau i prime could have the following two formats. They could either be disjoint or not disjoint. We can have it's equal to a, b, c, d, so that would be disjoint transpositions that are next to each other, in which case we can write this as the three cycle a, c, b multiplied into the three cycle a, c, d. So in that case, in the disjoint case of these two transpositions, we can write them as the product of these two three cycles. But if they're not disjoint, we might as well have A, B, A, C. And in that case, you can write it as A, C, B. I guess there's another case where they're the same two cycle, but that case is super boring because it just collapses to the identity, in which case we probably wouldn't include it in the expansion. Okay, so let's see. That means all of these pairs can be written as the product of three cycles, which means sigma can also be written as the product of three cycles, but that's the same thing as a n being generated by three cycles. For our next lemma, we'll take n to be bigger than or equal to three and n a normal subgroup of a n. Then we'll prove that if n contains a three cycle, then n is equal to the whole group. We actually used a simplified argument of this earlier where we showed that there was no subgroup of a four of order six. So essentially what we did is we got a three cycle inside of that subgroup and then showed that it had to be the whole group. But anyway, we're doing this kind of more in general. Okay, so let's start with the following observation. So let's note all three cycles can be written as products of three cycles of the form one, two, and then a blank right there. So that means we should be able to take any three cycle and write it as the product of a three cycle that starts with one and two. And this is really just a slog of calculation to get there. Let's start with something like this. So notice that one A two, that's most definitely a three cycle that's not of that form, but that's exactly equal to one two A one two A. So it's a product of two three cycles of that form. Now let's look at another one. What if we have one A, B? So I guess here we should point out that A, B, and we'll come up with C 
are all elements from three up to n. Okay, so if we've got one a, b, we should be able to write that in terms of one, two, blank, and one, two, blank. So after doing a little bit of calculation, you'll see that this is equal to one, two, b, and then one, two, a squared. And then what happens if we have like two a, b? Well, again, like some calculation shows us that we can write this as one, two, b squared, and then one, two, a. So I'm not doing any of these calculations like in depth, but you can check that these two permutations are the same fairly easily. Okay, so now we've got one more to check, and that's what if our three cycle contains only elements from three to n. So in other words, it's of the form a, b, c. Can we write that as the product of things that are one, two, blank? And we can, and it looks like this. One, two, a squared, and then next we have one, two, c, one, two, b squared, and then we end that off with another one, two, a. So this thing has the property that it takes a to b, b to c, and c back to a. And we can check that just a little bit for practice. Notice if we send a through this, this first uh, cycle will send it to one, and then this second cycle will send it to b, and that's because that thing is squared, and then, and then this third cycle will keep b itself because there's no b present, and then again, b stays itself. So in the end, a is sent to b, and then I'll let you check that all of the other parts work as well. Okay, so that's all about writing three cycles in that form. Now let's get to this lemma up here. So let's suppose that n contains a three cycle. So let's take a three cycle inside of n. So let's take a, b, c inside of n. And what we'll do is show that we can get one, two blank inside of n for an arbitrarily chosen m. Okay, so how can we get there? Well, let's notice that n is normal, and thus we can get another element of n fairly easily. So let's take 2b, 1a, so notice that's an element of the group a n, and let's sandwich a b in between that and the inverse of this. But notice the inverse of this well, it's exactly the same because we have disjoint two cycles. But that being said, if we didn't want to use the fact they're disjoint, we could just commute them. Um, again, they're two cycles, so they have their own inverse. So we have something like this. Okay, so let's first notice that this is most definitely an element of n, and that's because this is inside of the parent group a n. This is the inverse of what we have over here inside the parent group a n. And then this is inside the group which we assumed to be a normal subgroup. But remember, normal subgroups are closed under that sort of action. But then after multiplying this combination of cycles out, you'll see that we get 1, 2, C is inside of N. Okay, so if this three cycle is inside of N, then that three cycle is inside of N. But what we want to get is an arbitrary three cycle of this form inside of N. So 1, 2, really anything. So how we do that is let's take an element m from the set three, four, up to n, and let's note that the three cycle one, two, m can be written in a way so that we know it's inside of n. So in particular, it can be written as one, two, m, c, Okay, so that's inside of A4 because it's a product of two two cycles. And then we have one, two, C squared. That's inside of N because it's an element of N squared. And then over here, we'll have one, two, M, C inverse. So again, we're using this property of N being normal. But notice that this is an n, then we're conjugating by an element of a4, so that means it is inside of n. So let's notice what we've just shown. We've shown for all m between 3 and n, 1, 2, m is an element of n.
But then by this rule up here, we can write all three cycles using things of the form 1, 2, m. That means all three cycles are inside of n. But then also the three cycles generate a n. That means that everything inside of a n is inside of n, but that's exactly where we needed to end up. Okay, so now we're ready to go to the main result. Okay, now for the big result. Let's say that n is bigger than or equal to five. And what we'll do is show that a n contains no proper normal subgroup. That is, if n is a normal subgroup of a n, then n is the identity subgroup, the trivial subgroup, or it is the whole group a n. Okay, so what's our maybe outline here? Well, since we did all of those lemmas, we probably need to use them, and we'll use the last one. So let's take a subgroup n, a normal subgroup n that's not the identity subgroup, and what we'll do is show that it must contain a three cycle, but if it contains a three cycle, we can apply the previous lemma and end at n being equal to the whole group a n. Now, since n contains things that are not in the identity, we'll take one of those things. So let's take, I'll call it sigma, which is not equal to the identity inside of n, and then what we wanna do is write it as a product of disjoint cycles. So we know that any permutation can be written as a product of disjoint cycles. Okay, then let's look at some cases. So in this case, these cases will depend on the maybe length of those cycles. So let's start with our first case, which is there is a cycle of length bigger than or equal to four. Okay, well, we have some possibilities here. So sigma could only contain transpositions. It could contain transpositions and cycles of length three, or perhaps it could contain transpositions, cycles of length three, and then at least one cycle that's bigger than or equal to four, and that's the case right here. So now for simplicity, let's take our sigma to have the following format. So sigma will be of the form one, two, up to m, and then mu, where mu captures the rest of this. So in fact, what happened here is we moved the M cycle to the left, which is totally allowed because this is a product of disjoint cycles. And you might say, well, this M cycle is just containing the terms one, two, up to M. And that doesn't seem very arbitrary. Well, you could write this down like a little bit more carefully or what looks like a little bit more generally to take this M cycle to be A1, A2, up to AM, but other than the subscript, but other than the numbers being up here and the subscripts down at the bottom, the logic is exactly the same. So now what I'd like to do is make the following calculation observation. We can see that the three cycle one three m is equal to sigma inverse and then one two three and then sigma and then one, three, two, or one, two, three, inverse. Okay, and let's talk about where this element lies. So we know sigma inverse is most definitely an element of our normal subgroup. That's because sigma was in our normal subgroup. And then this sigma right here is also an element of our normal subgroup, whereas these two were elements of a n. Well, and they were inverse elements of a n. So since n is normal, we know this object right here, which I'll underline in yellow, is an element of n. That's by the normality. But then we combine it with another, another element of n, meaning that it's an element of n. So let's see. We showed that we've got a three cycle inside of n, but by that previous lemma, if we have a three cycle inside of n, that means that n is equal to the whole subgroup a n. Okay, now let's move on to the second case. Now we're ready to move on to our second case. And that is that sigma contains only two cycles and three cycles and no larger cycles, which was covered in that first case. But this is gonna involve some subcases. 
So subcase one says that sigma has at least two three cycles. So that means that we can write sigma in the following format, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then mu, where mu contains all of the rest of the disjoint cycles maybe combined together. And here we're like doing the same thing that we did before by instead of putting these in subscripts like A1, A2, A3, then A4, A5, A6, we can just put them in numbers because it's the same sort of logic. And notice if we have two disjoint three cycles, that means we're in A6 or larger, but that's kind of neither here nor there. Okay, so now where do we want to go from here? Well, let's notice the following. So we have the cycle one, four, two, six, three can be written as a combination of sigma and other things that give us something in sigma. So notice this is equal to sigma inverse times the three cycle one, two, four times sigma times the three cycle one, two, four inverse. And this is the same game exactly. So sigma inverse is an element of n, sigma is an element of n, and we're conjugating it by an element of a4. But by the normality of n, we know that this is an element of n. That means we're combining two elements of n, which means we get an element of n. Oh, but what does that mean? That means we found an element of n, which is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 cycle. But then we can just apply case number one. So we could just pick sigma to be this five cycle, but that means this sigma contains a cycle of length bigger than or equal to four, in particular this five cycle, but that means n is a n. So that covers everything for this subcase one. So we've got n equals a n. And now let's move on to subcase two. Okay, building off subcase one where sigma had at least two three cycles, the only thing left for case two would be sigma has exactly one three cycle and thus the rest two cycles. Okay, but that means that we can write sigma as the three cycle one, two, three, where again, we're writing it one, two, three, instead of a one, a two, a three, just for simplicity. And then, like I said, the product of a bunch of transpositions or two cycles. So we've got tau one, tau two, up to tau k. But now it's important to notice these are disjoint transpositions or disjoint two cycles by this assumption right here where we took sigma to be a product of disjoint cycles. So now let's take sigma squared and notice that since all of these are disjoint, we have commutativity, which means we can simply square all of the terms. You cannot generally do this, but again, because we've got disjoint cycles, this is okay. But again, because these are transpositions, we know they square to the identity. So we just get this three cycle squared, which is one, three, two. Oh, but if sigma is inside of n, then sigma squared is also inside of n. But that means we have a three cycle inside of n. But if we have a three cycle inside of n, that means by that previous lemma that n must be the whole alternating group a n. Okay, now let's move on to our third case. Okay, to finish this thing off, we have the remaining case, which is that sigma is a product of disjoint two cycles. So that means it doesn't have any three cycles or above. Those were covered in the previous cases. And that means we can write sigma as one, two, three, four, and then what I'll call mu, where mu captures everything else. Or maybe, and furthermore, we know that mu squares to the identity. Well, in fact, sigma squares to the identity. That's because it's a product of disjoint two cycles. Okay, so now let's do our calculation. Let's notice that the product of two disjoint two cycles given by one, three, two, four can be written as sigma inverse and then one, two, three, that three cycle, sigma one, three, two, which is also one, two, three inverse. And by this rule that we've been using over and over again, we know that this is most definitely an element of N. That's because we've got a normal subgroup here. And now we're ready to 
And now we're ready to make this sort of calculation one more time. And let's notice that the three cycle one, three, five can be written as this one, three, two, four, which is an element of n by our above calculation. And then times one, three, five times our one, three, two, four, and then one, three, five inverse. Okay, so this is all an element of n because of normality of n. This is an element of n by our above calculation. So those calculations tell us that 1, 3, 5 is also an element of n, but that means n contains a three cycle, but then n containing a three cycle means it's the whole group. So putting all of this together, we see that if we have a normal subgroup of a n that is non-trivial, it must be the whole group. And that's going to motivate the following definition. Now we're ready for kind of a big definition. So we say a group G is simple if it has no proper normal subgroup. So the finite simple groups are kind of thought of as analogs or group theoretic analogs of the prime numbers. Now we can put all of those results, or maybe that biggest result, into the following context. A n is simple for all n not equal to four. So the theorem proved that a n was simple for n bigger than or equal to five. And then these other cases above that are fairly simple. So a one is simply equal to the trivial group. And that's because S1 is also equal to the trivial group. A2 is simply equal to the trivial group as well. And that's because S2 only contains the identity and the transposition 1, 2, which is odd. Now A3 contains the identity, the three cycle 1, 2, 3, and the three cycle 1, 3, 2. In fact, it's a cyclic group generated by 1, 2, 3, which means it's isomorphic to Z3. But Z3 is simple because any subgroup, well, the order of any subgroup would have to divide three, but only one and three can do that. So this, in fact, doesn't have any subgroups. Uh, which means it has no normal subgroups. Then, like I said, for n bigger than or equal to five, that's the theorem. But if n is equal to four, we do not have simplicity. In fact, the following four element set made up of products of two cycles is normal inside of A4. Maybe I'll leave that checking as a warm up. Now, I'd like to leave you with some more exercises as well. Now for some warm ups. So the first one is what I had on the last board to check that that following four element set is a normal subgroup of A4. Then let's find two subgroups of A8 of order four, a cyclic one as well as a non-cyclic one. Then let's find an element of order A15 and A10, and then finally show that Zn is simple if and only if n is a prime. So that means that these cyclic groups of order primes, as well as those alternating groups, are both nice infinite families of simple groups. And that's a good place to stop.